This is the beginning. Here are the stones, right? So here are the glyphs. And what's particularly poignant about these paintings is the kind of deep devotion, the absolute, and devotion is the appropriate word, that this young artist has to this imagery. He's not only looking at these rocks, but, and we can't call them rocks, they're stones, and they're very specific. These are special, we could say they have talismanic properties, right? They're, they have a magical aspect to them. And the word I might have used earlier, they have an incantatory power to them. He knows it, even though he's still really, really young. He's focusing very diligently on them. And yet, and of course we think of certain artists. We can think of the purity of Piero della Francesca, who, with whom he probably was familiar and might have been a favorite of his. And it's impossible not to think of de Chirico and uh, an important word for de Chirico, an important word in many of the titles of his paintings was enigma. And of course, that's what we have here. The enigma is depicted with the shadows of the objects. But what I find interesting about this painting, and only someone who knows what it is to paint objects, would I know this, all the shadows are invented and they have a life all their own. They have nothing to do with the objects whatsoever. So that tells us that he was a very clever young artist, that he could be completely devoted to trying to represent in a you know, highly illusionistic manner, using illusionistic strategies, the surface of these stones, but he took this tremendous liberty by depicting the shadows that they were, because we can see right here, this is a, clearly a curve with a unbelievably rectilinear shadow, which would be utterly and completely impossible. Often, at the very early stages of an artist's work, you can see the seeds of their maturity. And it's almost as if, well, the seeds are there, the, the, the essential artistic personality has presented itself, but then it has to go through this journey to maturity. So this drawing is from around 1965, and it's difficult for me not to think of Richard Deben Corner when I'm looking at this drawing. And we know how close Bill was to Richard, and you see how both of these artists had this deep affection to the figure. Later we can see what Bill did with the figure when he made it his own. What's really interesting is that the expression in these is so antithetical to the expression we see in the mature work of, of Bill Bryce because those pictures are not expressionistic. The expression is elegiac, we could say, you know, and he himself in the catalog would read about how often the statements that he would make about his work certainly included the transcendent or the spiritual, the thing that gives meaning to life. This particular drawing is a little bit different and has those illusionistic properties that are similar to the little still lifes of stones upstairs. Uh, what I find particularly uh, interesting about this, this picture is we're looking at two views of the same figure. We're seeing the back and the front, which tells us that there was a fascination for him with the lessons of cubism, although there's never any cubist look per se in any of these. And the sculptural aspect of this thing is difficult to ignore. And most importantly, this sense of 
monumentality. And if, if nothing else, you know, that's certainly something that comes across in all of these mature works. All right, so here we have finally arrived at the um, mature Bill Bryce. And here you can see that he's finally allowing himself to be free to be himself. So you have this figure and you can see that they're very encoded. It's almost as if these things are a DNA code, right? He has distilled these images. Even though a lot of this work is very linear, um, you can see that Bill was really not so much a drawer that he was a painter. And painting is about light, primarily, and drawing is about structure. We could say that Picasso was a drawer, and he could, he could use as much paint and all the colors in the world as he wanted to, but the, the paintings were still descriptive of structure. Whereas Matisse could draw two lines and you have a sense of light and space, not about structure whatsoever. We've spoken about stone from the very start here, and another word for stone is a glyph, and also an, a related word are hieroglyphics. And we can see that he, there, there, is, there seem to be two texts. You know, there's the general overall message of the image of this monumental figure, which is always female. And it's difficult not to think of the Venus of Willendorf, the generative, the creative, etc. Then there is a subtext to these which, uh, which we can see in this, these hieroglyphics, right? There's enough of this imagery that keeps getting repeated that we know probably had some private symbolic meaning. We can see that in this case, he has turned the entire figure into a hieroglyph. Here, he's used the charcoal not so much for shading, but to give us a particular atmosphere the emphasis on the figure is white lines, the, the highlighting, and turned the entire figure into a hieroglyph itself, rather than being a primary image that has accompanying language. And those hieroglyphs, as we know, in archaic art, in the Sumerian reliefs, and in Egyptian art, etc., are always a text that is telling us something about this figure, contextualizing it. And since we're in the world of abstraction, and we're also in the world of private or, you know, symbols, it stands to reason that these would be um, really enigmatic, but the word I'm, using, I'm looking for is really hermetic uh, writing, right? And even though to the end, to most of us who are uninitiated with Egyptian or other earlier scripts, they seem, you know, mysterious to us because we can't read them. And certainly, why would we expect to read this script too? Very well. And so finally, I'd like to turn over here, if you don't mind. And uh, finally, we come to this drawing here, which is, again, you know, a superlative example of that distillation. And what he's done over and over again here, you can see this is really, I think, um, very uh, telling and it's really speaks to Bill's real understanding of this image. When we started out with that more illusionistic seemingly carved image in the other uh, part of the exhibition. Uh, we saw this sort of buttocks component, but it was attached. We could see it being attached to a piece of stone that curved around. But here, what I find interesting is that this is at the same time, and this is where he really understood what the Cubists were doing and was able 
you know, to adopt it and make it his own in a very personal and I think I don't want to trivialize this, but I do think endearing way. And what I'm talking about is that, and, and certainly inventive, if we just isolate this image by itself, clearly we're looking at a buttocks from the top down, and we could imagine it as being part of that back there. But here it also acts as the hip and thigh. It's simultaneously both, and I'm sure he knew what, that you know, he, this was very deliberate, and this tells us a lot about what he knew and what is required sometimes of a certain degree of initiation in order to be able to decode works of art. And here, he's finally distilled. There is no shading whatsoever in this picture. He's letting the line do all the work, and if you imagine that that is an easy task, then I want you to think again. This, this is an example of mastery. The rhythms of all of these lines, their relationship to each other, and the shapes that they describe, along with the complexity, we can almost sense that the hieroglyphs that we were talking about a minute ago have now been converted into these roses. And of course, the rose is always a symbol of not only femininity, but often a symbol of wisdom or enlightenment. And we can imagine that by this point in an artist's life, I'm not suggesting in any way that Bill had some epiphany and he was enlightened, but I am suggesting that there comes a time in a person's life when they cross a certain threshold of maturity. And that, I think, is what we are seeing in, in this picture. He has found himself, and he's completely comfortable. There's no anxiety about being validated by an outside source about what he wants to say and who he thinks he is and what is valid. And of course, all of this work is deeply personal. We turn to this last painting in our discussion Clearly, you know, we can revisit a lot of the vocabulary that we've been using up until now. Monumental. And it's the stone that's important. Even the entire painting feels as if it were a stone steely, right? With engraving marks in it. And uh, what is also interesting, especially in this painting, and we can see it in other pictures too, if we look for it, one of those sort of camouflaged into the hieroglyphic components, and most of the hieroglyphic components, if we wanted to analyze them more closely, we could see are openings. They are thresholds to something. And we can definitely see a threshold there. We know that threshold very well. And we can see it over there, too, in that picture. What I want to say about this painting also is that it could easily be misunderstood to the uninitiated, we also see technical mastery in this line. This line, in, in order to make this painting work, it just seems, you know, really quite uh, spontaneous and um, simple, and I, I don't mean simplistic that way, but you know, um, s relatively um, simple in that there aren't too many components. We have a background gray, and then we have the gray lines drawn in. But just as I was speaking about the drawing downstairs, the proportions of all of those shapes and the rhythmic, sinewy continuity of that line shows a kind of mastery that is equivalent to this sort of observation here.
And that, of course, is what we have in this painting here. The discipline to be able to have a fully complete, completely engaging painting with such few components says a lot. It speaks of mastery. This is the young, you know, the beginning of his understanding that that mastery is available if you really devote yourself to it. And this, of course, is the kind of mastery that is difficult for people who are uninitiated to appreciate. The way this line, not only the rhythms, but the way the brush starts and stops is very, very important because if these paintings had been done with that kind of continuous line that we see in the drawings, they would fall apart completely. This painting would not hold up. This, this kind of jitteriness and the way the brush is fully loaded right there and it, the paint is dissipating from it at the bottom is an essential aspect of what holds this painting together, the tension that allows it allows this image to hold the painting. So we can see that in the end, I'm sure Bill knew that he, his life's work was meaningful, that he set out to be an artist, that there was this treacherous adventure then in finding oneself, and that he did in the end find himself. And I don't, think, I don't think there's any equivocation about that. I don't think anybody speaking or looking at the work would ever question the fact that we have a sense of grandeur and, and resolution here that is worthy of celebrating. And I'm really delighted to have had an opportunity to speak about these pictures. Thank you.